What's the, you got some good questions? Oh yeah, we got two really good ones this week. Let me get to them. <clears throat> this one comes from Brandon on YouTube. I just recently discovered your content. Really appreciate someone experienced putting out this knowledge. Welcome to the party, Brandon. <laughs> Do you have any recommendations for a shop limited by technician load? This is an opportunity out the wazoo, but with only four techs and six bays, I'm not sure how to seize it. Yeah, so the industry is losing two techs for every new one coming in. Are you serious? Yeah, it's and it's not going to get better. No, it's not. What I would suggest is go to chriscollinsinc.com and sign up for our on-demand and in there, there's a module that's called Technician Tree. And it's how to grow your own technicians, how to hire the top technicians, and how to maintain the ones you have. It's kind of three different parts. And so there's some tools in there how you can hire. But the thing that you want to get good at, Brandon, is hiring techs. Because the future is whoever has the techs wins. The other thing that I see oftentimes is when you struggle hiring techs, your culture in the shop is terrible because you need the techs more than they need you. So you have a bunch of terrible techs with terrible attitudes that don't want to work driving the culture in your shop. Damn, you just described my shop. <laughs> oh. So technician tree, bro, get in there, buy it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every technician usually is worth between 10 and 15,000 in gross profit a month. So if you can't afford the on-demand, you probably might want to get into another industry. Absolutely. Can we talk about the supply and demand factor on this as well? So when you are no. at... <laughs> what does that you mean? You heard it first here. What does SDR? that mean, supply and demand? Supply and demand, right? So as demand increases and supply decreases, what happens to pricing? I, I don't think we're aggressive enough on our pricing right now as an industry. So what, think, when you, what you mean by pricing is what we pay the tax? No, I'm talking retail pricing. <clears throat> oh, to afford to pay the tax. Yes. So your effective labor rate yes. should be higher. Yes. So then, well, I'm going to translate for you guys what Jeremy's saying. Um, what he's saying is you should get your effective labor rate up, so you should teach your advisors how to sell. You need to learn pricing strategies, how to create a menu, all that, because as things go forward, the cost of a technician is going to go up, yeah, and I and want to get you, ahead of that curve right yeah. now. I want to be able to afford paying a technician forty to fifty to sixty dollars an hour to get in that range. I've got to have my effective labor rate at one fifty, one seventy five, two hundred, two twenty five. If I have the demand and I'm backlogged, like for instance, in my shop, I just did this yesterday. Cleaned all the old ROs over. My work in progress is clean. We have sixty eight. You just push some cars out in the street. Yes, and we let <laughs> the city of Hisperia can pick them up. Uh, 68 active cars that are actually working in our shop right now with two technicians. That's a month's worth of work in you, you a week. You need more techs, bro. We do, absolutely. But if I can't find the techs, then I increase my pricing till the car count drops and find that happy medium. So instead of maybe having 68 cars, I go to 28. But if I increase my pricing by 60, 70%, what's going to happen to my net? It's going to go up. And could I then afford to pay a tech 50 bucks an hour? Yes, I could. And then I could attract the top talent to my shop yeah. and then balance it out. So that's kind of the balance that I'm talking that's about. That's how Jeremy's mind works. That, it is. All that. I hope you guys followed that because he went around the cul-de-sac and then through yeah, the backyard. That was crystal clear in my mind. I don't know how confusing fence. that was. <laughs> no, it's a good, it's a very good point. That's the supply and demand economics of Did a Did you understand shop. that, Don? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I get you a drink? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll circle back to that. It sounds later. like Don's already had it. Sounds like I need to start looking for a new podcast you got to a... work on. <laughs> what? No, do, you got, do you got another one? Yeah, we got another question. Uh, this one also comes from YouTube from Pete. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Pete. Do you guys like the idea of waiving diagnostic fees in order to capture the repair? Curious about your response. If we lose the job to another shop, he only gets the diagnostic. If I sell the job, I can potentially get them a better chance at more hours. Plus, sometimes you don't lose anything and get both time and diagnostic. Just curious how most others perceive it, plus wanted Chris's feedback. Pete is short for Peter, can you imagine? I would, probably. Peter. Yes. <laughs> Wait, you say yes to that? Yeah, I've done it I, before. I say no to that. What do you mean? I'm totally on the other side of the fence on that. That's just weak sales skills is all that is. 
So I go to our on-demand platform. You've got total training. Get a coach to help you deal with this. Now, here's my point on this. If your shop is skilled enough to diagnose the problem and the customer is going to go to another shop to have them repair it, I've got a very big issue with that. Why didn't you go to the other shop in the first place? Okay, you're at the right shop. Our testing fees pay for themselves when you consider how much time and money is wasted by doing any repairs that we don't know the root of the problem. So I'm not a fan of waiving diagnostic charges and it's a shell game, right? It's, it's tough, it's an invoicing thing. Well, we zero out the Diag line and then we put the hour labor or two hours labor down in the repair line. So then we artificially inflate our repair price and then the customer takes that and goes and shops it and finds a cheaper price. But it's not about that. Especially now, we just talked about the shortage of technicians, right? So I'm a fan of setting up your diagnostic testing fees properly the first time, charge a fair price for them, and don't waive them if the testing's been completed. You've earned it. Leave it on the ticket and charge properly for the repair as well. So you're telling me that if a customer brings their car in for diagnosis, mm -hmm. and let's say you're half an hour into the diagnosis, mm -hmm and the repair is a thousand bucks, you would let them leave for the thousand bucks and not do the repair? That, that's not what I said. Oh, what did you say? I would tell you that the total to fix your car today is 1150. Would you like me to proceed? But in a situation where the customer perceives that their other shop that can't diagnose it, Correct. but can fix it for less, Correct. you would let them take it there if it came to that? No. They wouldn't leave. You're missing the point. That's just a sales objection he's got to get over. He's not skilled at dealing with the sales objection. You know, it's like we've got dumb things that advisors say or do when a customer says, no, that's coming up. But it's simply a sales objection. We should close that sale. You have the car. You've got the diagnostic test completed. You've got the right technician. If you didn't take it to them to diagnose it, how are they going to properly verify the repair? It's simply a point of closing the sale at that point. You've got to close it. You can't let that go. So I don't, I don't disagree with what you're it's saying. It's like all these millennials that don't, you know, they hop in and out of relationships whoa, whoa, whoa. and Tinder and all that stuff. Just because I see Tinder? it happen. What, what about Tinder? Well, I don't know anything about Tinder. I'm just saying that. Sounds like you know a lot about Tinder. <laughs> I don't know anything about Tinder, actually. What is it? No, what I was going to say um, before you brought up Tinder was <laughs> that um, <laughs> I've, a couple times I've had those. Um, so Ford had a bunch of my clients open these like express right. service departments like five miles away from their dealership mm -hmm. and they would lose money, you know, and one of the marketing campaigns I would do over and over again that would work was check engine lights free and that sort of thing. Correct. So I don't know, like I agree with what you're saying, but in every situation I could, I could raise my labor rate up my effective and be okay riding off a little diagnosis sometimes okay. to keep a job. Okay. Is what I'm saying. You're what you're saying is right. I'm just taking the counterpoint that in some situations I've done that and okay. it's worked. So then there's not a black and white answer to this question. No, but your answer is <clears throat> more right than mine. No, it's it's not about being right. It's about helping our viewers and you know help him close more of those jobs. You know he might be in a very competitive market. Well, it's about being right. <clears throat> you're more right. Do you Thank got you. another one, Don, or is that it for this week? <laughs> That's it for this week, Chris. Thanks, Don. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching this clip of Service Drive Revolution. Now you can catch the full episode on YouTube, iTunes, or Spotify, or wherever you consume your podcast. If you have any questions, go ahead and post them in the comments below. Make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon so you're notified when we post new episodes. I'm Chris Collins and you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Chris Bulldog Collins. And I'll see you again on the next episode.